Welcome everyone. Welcome to Girl Day at UT Austin, our virtual experience for 2022. While we're sad we don't get to see you in person on campus today, we're excited about what we have to offer today uh, for our programming. I'm Trisha Berry. I'm the Executive Director for Women in STEM within the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement at the University of Texas at Austin. Helping to answer your questions and navigate behind the scenes today, we have Women in STEM Director Anna Dyson and Assistant Director Amy Beebe. We are excited to welcome you this morning to our Girl Day Zoom webinar. We have a whole slate of demonstrations, including creating clouds and zooming to the moon, smashing frozen bananas and more. And this afternoon in Gatherly, we have hundreds of amazing STEM role models ready to do hands-on activities and live demonstrations with you in small video group chats, trying to mimic our in-person Girl Day experiences. You're gonna hear in just a few moments from two of our amazing presenting partners, BASF and Halliburton. STEM role models for both companies will also be joining in this afternoon in Gatherly. So I encourage you to go visit them and thank them and say hi and experiment with them. You'll also get to do some virus hunting this morning with STEM role models from Girl Day leader Abbott. You'll get to meet other Girl Day leaders from 3M and Apple and Cadence and Sears Logic and Gatherly this afternoon. So thank you to all of our fabulous corporate partners. We have two special welcomes for you to kick off things this morning. One from our fabulous partner, the Girl Scouts of Central Texas. I know there's a lot of Girl Scouts out there. So hi, Girl Scouts. We're so glad you could join in. And our other welcome is from UT Austin's Vice President for the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement, Dr. Latoya Smith. So with that, let me share my screen and let's hear what they have to say. Hi everyone and welcome to Girl Day at UT Austin. My name is Paula Bokaitis and I'm the CEO at Girl Scouts of Central Texas. It's great to see so many of you who are interested in exploring science, technology, engineering, and math. As you Girl Scouts out there already know, Girl Scouts is a place where you can try new things, identify issues you care about, and take action in our community to change the world. So many world-changing advancements come from the fields of science, technology, and engineering, and we need more girls and women to help guide those advancements so the progress we make as a society takes our needs and perspectives into account. If you want to continue getting more hands-on STEM experiences after today, check out all the STEM opportunities available through Girl Scouts of Central Texas. If you're not already a Girl Scout, there's a place for you with us. Visit www.gsctx.org join to learn more. We hope to see you today at our Girl Scout activity. Have a great day. Good morning, I'm Dr. Latoya Smith, the Vice President for the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement here at the University of Texas at Austin. And I wanna welcome you to UT's annual Girl Day. We look forward to this event every year when girls like you get together to learn about careers in the STEM fields of science, technology, math, and engineering. More than 50 departments at UT are sponsoring this event. And they range from the science and engineering departments to student groups that have interests in all things STEM. We want you to have fun today, getting involved in lots of cool activities and meeting many interesting UT students and professors. But we also want you to leave today knowing that you have a future as a scientist, an engineer, a researcher, doctor, or technology innovator. You could be the one who helps solve future water and environmental problems, finds cures to cancer, launches a rocket, designs roads, bridges, and transportation systems, or develops new computers, apps, and robots that change lives. So have fun today and keep your eyes open to all the possibilities that smart girls like yourselves have for the future. We are depending on you to become our future problem solvers and leaders and there is no power like girl power. At UT, we have a saying that what starts here changes the world, and we hope that Girl Day changes your world. So thank you for participating, and we hope we'll see you on campus real soon. Hook em horns.
So thank you to the Girl Scouts of Central Texas and to Vice President Latoya Smith for joining in this morning to help us kick off things with their wonderful welcomes. A couple of things to note, I see the chat's already going like crazy, so feel free to use the chat to join in in the conversation. We are using the Q&A portion of the webinar for questions and answers. That's gonna be the easiest way for the, us to respond and our STEM role models throughout the morning to respond on questions that you might have as we go throughout their different presentations and their demonstrations. So please use that Q&A space throughout the day um, and we'll try to keep up with the chat as well. At this time, I am super thrilled to invite our MCs for today to join us. Allison Davis and Emily Lessig, who are ecology, evolution, and behavior graduate students in the College of National Sciences here at UT Austin. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Allison and Emily. Take it away. All right, good morning, everyone. So I am Allison and I am a lover of all things fish. Right now, I'm a grad student studying how the environment affects an animal's behavior using a fish that clones itself. And one day I hope to continue studying all sorts of fishy behavior um, as I become a college professor. Great, um, and my name is Emily Lessig, as Trisha said, and so I am a PhD student here at UT. Um, broadly, I study social behavior and cognition, also in a fish, the African cichlid fish, um, and I also want to continue doing research um, and teaching as a professor um, in the long term as well. Um, and so with that, um, I think we're both really excited to participate in Girl Day today. And so I'd first off like to welcome our Girl Day presenting partners, BASF and Halliburton. Welcome, welcome to UT Girl Day. We're so excited to have you guys. It's awesome that you're interested in a STEM related field. Uh, we are gonna talk to you a little bit about what Halliburton does, where oil comes from, and some of the things you use every single day in your daily life that comes from the oil and gas industry. Hey y'all, my name is Leah and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Halliburton and what we do. First of all, Halliburton has been around for over a hundred years years. Can you believe that? That's older than some of your grandparents. Now, what do we do? Halliburton helps to bring energy to the entire world. We have the products, we have the technology, and we have the skills to take all of the oil out of the ground. Now, where does this oil come from? Well, that's what Sydney's going to tell you a little bit more about here. Hey y'all, I'm Sydney, and I'm going to talk to you about what is oil and where does it come from? So a long, long time ago, dinosaurs roamed the earth. When those dinosaurs and other organisms became extinct, they then became one with the earth. When that happened, they were buried by sand and a lot of other substances. The heat from the earth and the weight from those rocks formed those organisms into oil. So this is why oil is found underground and why we at Halliburton have to drill for it. So now I'm gonna pass this to Daniela and she's gonna talk to you a little bit more about how we utilize and use oil in our everyday lives and what it looks like. So once oil is found underground, companies will hire Halliburton to go in there and dig it all up and take it out of the ground. So why do we need this? I'm sure you've seen someone at the gas station filling up their car with gas. So we actually need oil for much more than just cars. There are so many things you use in your everyday life that come from the oil and gas industry. And I'm gonna go through some of those examples now. Like the toothbrush and toothpaste you use every single morning. Or the shoes on your feet. Or the crayons you color with. Or what about the lipstick on your lips or the nail polish on your nails. All these are items that come from the oil and gas industry. So next time you're using your crayons, you can think back on this. So we hope you learned something today about Halliburton, who we are, what we do, where oil might come from, and how you might use it in your day-to-day -day lives. We're excited to meet with you guys later this afternoon. Please make sure to stop by our booth and have all your materials ready for the experiment.
My name is Elizabeth Monroe and I am the Site Director at the BASF Beaumont facility in Texas. I chose a career in manufacturing because I was a student who was interested in chemistry and math and science. I had some really great teachers and uh, I remember them telling me that I should pursue a field in engineering and I didn't really know what that meant. Uh, my dad was a quality control chemist at a manufacturing facility and I have really strong memories of going to a take your daughter to work day at his plant and getting to see the machinery, the operation. It had a really big impact on me. It seemed really interesting. So when I chose chemical manufacturing, I was excited for an opportunity to work for the biggest chemical producer in the world. I like working in manufacturing because there's always some new challenge and opportunity to solve a problem. No day is the same and I really enjoy that in my job. Uh, BASF, uh, we have great assets and the greatest assets that we have are our people. Uh, a typical day for me as a site director, um, I get to ensure the safe operation of my plant and that my people go home the way that they showed up. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the systems that we have in place to protect our people. Uh, also, one of my favorite days of the week is Wednesday here in Beaumont. We get to go into the control rooms. All of the leadership team talks with the production units, with the operators, uh, and talks about different things that are going on, problems they may have, and how we can help them out. Uh, I love the face-to-face -face interaction. I love the diversity of the people um, at the site, and it's really my favorite day of the week. I enjoy working in manufacturing and especially during the COVID times, manufacturing and those that work as essential uh, in our manufacturing industry are really the unsung heroes of this whole pandemic. They've showed up to work uh, and produce the products that we need to continue to run as a country and provide those solutions to people. And I really am thankful and grateful to be able to work for uh, a manufacturing company like BSF. Uh, when I found out that I was nominated and had been sel selected as an honoree, um, I was just ecstatic. Uh, this is a, a program that I've heard of and I've seen my colleagues nominated and accepted for. Uh, it was a really great honor to be selected. Uh, I am a sponsor for the FLAME program at BSF. It's a program dedicated to encouraging women to stay within manufacturing. It's female leaders advancing match manufacturing excellence. And uh, we do our kickoff event normally at the Step Ahead Awards. And so being able to be a nominee, be accepted uh, as an honoree, and then get to share that with my flame cohorts uh, that I sponsor was really special. I would say that uh, as a woman in manufacturing, I would give people the advice to stick with it. You have a seat at the table, uh, you offer a different perspective, and your voice deserves to be heard. My name is Lauren Hampton, and I am the Operations and Compliance Engineer at the Pasadena site in Pasadena, Texas. So I feel like I just kind of fell into a career in manufacturing. Um, I was very fortunate. My dad had, you know, really been encouraging when I was in high school. You know, you might want to pursue something in engineering. Um, so I went after that and uh, didn't really know what I would do with it. And so in college, I had the opportunity to do a couple of different internships. Um, I had an internship in a manufacturing facility. And um, that's where I figured out, you know, this atmosphere that I felt like I could really thrive in would be in manufacturing. I love the culture that is manufacturing. It's very fast paced. Um, there's different challenges every single day. Um, and I love the company um, BASF because we have uh, such a diverse portfolio. Um, kind of coming out of college and, and getting the opportunity to work with BASF. I like the idea of working with different chemistries, working at different sites, and being a part of this global company that was creating solutions um, all over the world. I would describe um, working in manufacturing as fun. 
Sometimes it's uh, an exciting kind of fun, sometimes it's a challenging kind of fun, uh, but overall um, I really enjoy the atmosphere. Um, there's always challenges, uh, new things to look at, new issues to explore. Um, and with that, I get to work with a great team every day, um, you know, looking at as an operations engineer, you know, looking at our process, what's going well, what's not going well, what do we need to address, and you know, then planning about whenever we're going to um, look at things, when we're going to uh, make certain products, and making sure that all of it aligns with our business so that we can produce for our customers. Um, I think there's just so many things to do in a day that sometimes, you know, it's 7.30 is our morning meeting and then before I know it, it's time to go home. It's, it's a full and fun day. Being recognized as a step ahead emerging leader is really a great honor. Um, I think that the program is really significant. I've heard a lot about it for many years. Um, and to find out that um, I've been recognized to even be nominated um, really made me very proud of the hard work that I've done over my uh, career um, and you know I've always tried to do my work with um, uh, with excellence and trying to be really um, intentional about how I treat the people I work with and be respectful and I think that um, getting this honor uh, just kind of shows that you know, my work was noticed by uh, BASF and it gives me a lot of ambition for my future um, and what I have to bring to manufacturing. I would tell any woman um, interested in manufacturing uh, that you belong in manufacturing. Um, and not just that, that you uh, should consider yourself a valued asset to manufacturing. Um, your perspective, um, your uh, knowledge is very needed. Um, and you know, when you come in, be willing to jump in, be willing to um, take on challenging assignments and uh, be willing to work with others and be able to get the, um, the job done. Um, and then, you know, once you get into manufacturing, make sure you look for ways to give back. Um, whether it be volunteering, getting involved with employee resource groups, do something to help the next generation of women that are coming behind you. Hi, I'm Christy Pickering. I am the Utilities and Infrastructure Director at the BSF site in Geismar, Louisiana. So I've known I wanted to be in manufacturing probably since I was in high school. Um, I had a high school chemistry teacher and she was very inspiring. She had been in the industry before and she took a group of, of females to one of the refineries for a career day and really ever since that day I've been energized and, and knew that manufacturing was the career choice for me. I've been working in manufacturing for 24 years. And through that time, I've had lots of different development opportunities from breath assignments, but also assignments that helped me to grow my career in terms of advancing my leadership skills. A typical day in manufacturing will, will vary, but there are some common themes that, that tend to go throughout the day. Um, every morning, I like to check in with my team just to see what's going on in the plant, to make sure we don't have any issues that need to be addressed in the morning. Um, after the check-in, depending on, on what types of projects we have, uh, we may go on a field walk, uh, focusing on EHS issues. Then the rest of my day is typically spent meeting with colleagues from across the site on strategic topics. Uh, sometimes I'll have staff meetings with my team, um, or very often I'll have one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings with either my team members or uh, the various mentees that I have. Being a step ahead honoree for me really signifies um, a recognition of the contributions of women in manufacturing. In the past, I think it, it was much more difficult for, for women's contributions to be recognized in manufacturing. And, and what I've seen through my career is that there is a, a, an advancement of women in manufacturing to a much higher degree um, and a recognition of what the, the skills and the talents that women can bring to manufacturing. I find with the, the work that both BSF and, and the industry in general has done around inclusion and diversity is very important and, and to me this is one of those signs that those, those efforts are working, they're bringing value and, and they're really helping people who maybe wouldn't have considered leadership roles in manufacturing before to see others in, in that type of a space and know that they also can achieve or aspire to be in those roles. If I saw my chemistry teacher today, I would say thank you for that plant visit. Thank you for opening my eyes to a potential that I knew nothing about. It really helped to shape my career um, and, and really my future. 
So it's been, um, you know, it wasn't something I had expected from a very small interaction with her. And, and she went a little bit out of her way and, and made a huge impact on me and, and others as well. BASF, we create chemistry. All right, well, thank you for those videos from our sponsor. Up next, we're gonna hear from the UT Austin Chemistry Department's glass shop. Now, I personally have used and interacted with this glass shop in order to create a lot of my fishy experiments, but for today, they have something extra fun. So they challenge students to come up with some imaginary invention to kind of help solve a problem that we're seeing today in our world. So they'll be actually turning their glass into their glass ideas into reality um, later today. Right now, we're going to invite Adam Kennedy, a scientific glass blower, and our four finalists to join us. Our four finalists are Isabel from third grade, Catherine from second grade, May from first grade, and Rose from kindergarten. All right, Adam, take it away. All right, well, we have had so many good entries and we had a tough time choosing that we've decided we have a tie for first place. So we will be spending today making all four of these things. So come check us out later today and you'll get to see each of these. So we have a question for Adam or for the folks in the glass shop. And one of those questions is how long does it take for the glass to, to blow glass? And so, Adam, maybe you can talk for the second just about that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it can be, depending on the project, some things we can do in just a matter of minutes. And then some projects take a whole day or multiple days. So depending on the complexity, today we're going to sort of push our limits and we've already started. So we're going to see, we're going to make all four of these things today. So you'll get to see it later this afternoon on the Halliburton floor, third floor. We'll be there all day. Come see us. And the kids, come interact with us. Tell us more about your, uh, your inventions. We'd love to learn more. Hi. Hi. What do you think about that? You want to tell us what your invention was for a second? Uh-huh. Um, mine is where it's an uh, invention that does glass. Um, it's made out of glass, but it picks up trash. That is awesome. That is so important for our world. What a great solution. I can't wait to see what our glass shop creates for that. And then I see we have another one of our finalists. Do you want to share with us too your invention? Yes. Um, so my invention is, so it's a drink um, that tastes like anything you want and um, leaves that taste in your mouth um, for um, the whole day and gives the nutrients you need for the whole day. Um, and you only have to drink one of the drinks. Um, and it comes in a pack of 100 and it only casts once two cents. Oh my goodness, that is amazing. <laughs> I want this drink solution. Those are great inventions. Well, thank you both for participating and submitting these cool things that our world definitely needs. We're going to come back to, to Adam and to our glass shop at 1230 to check in and see how things are going. But then they'll also be running their live stream from 1.30 to 4 this afternoon in Gatherly. So we'll all be excited to check in and see how it's coming together. Thank you, thank you for sharing with us your inventions. We'll see Adam at 12.30. Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna turn it back over to Emily and Allison. All right, thanks again for sharing. These inventions seem really great and we can't wait to see these later on turn into reality. Um, so next up, I wanna welcome Dr. Julia Clark, who's the Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, as well as Annabelle Cunningham, 
who's the president of the Geosciences Leadership Organization for Women, or GLOW, in the Department of Geological Sciences, the Jackson School of Geosciences, for a special Girl Day welcome from the Jackson School. Please take it away. Well, hello, Girls' Day participants. Um, I'm Dr. Julia Clark, and I do wear a dean hat, but I also am a paleontologist. That means that I study things like dinosaurs. They live in the Jackson School of Geoscience with me. I also study things like bird eggs, and I make discoveries in the field all over the world, seeking out new data on environments of the past, animals of the past, and how they link up with animals of the present day. So as part of my Girl Day work, welcome, I wanna introduce where my journey started. I loved animals. I love stuffed animals. I love seeing animals in the zoo. And I just wanted to understand how they were all connected with each other, with the past. And I wanted to be an explorer. So those are the kinds of things that I do as a dinosaur paleontologist. And what I want to do is encourage you guys today um, at all the exciting booths to find out more about all of the different kinds of science that you can do. So in, in the Jackson School of Geoscience, we study deep climate. This is a fossilized um, piece of coral that has crystals growing inside, something I found super cool. This is some petrified wood. So I'm gonna turn it over now to our president of our, our Geoscience Leadership Organization of Women, Annabelle Cunningham, to tell you a little bit more about what you can see this afternoon. Annabelle, take it away. Hi, I'm Annabelle and I'm so excited to be here. Let me just share my screen. Let's see, there we go. So you can see the PowerPoint now. So I'm a senior studying at UT in geophysics. I love being a geoscientist because I see more than just rocks when I look at the earth. I see plants and animals that live millions of years, continents moving across the surface of the planet, and volcanoes and earthquakes shaking the world around us. Geology is about more than just rocks. It's about understanding the planet you live on. One of my favorite things to do with geology is to use seismic waves, like the ones created by earthquakes, to create pictures of what's deep inside the earth. These are some of the things you scientists are doing today. Oil and gas. Water. Minerals. Volcanoes. Oceans and other planets. Do you like being outside? Are you curious about the world around you? Do you like looking at all the colors and stripes in the rocks? The adventure starts here. Geology is about more than just the past, it's about the future. To find out more about what geoscientists do, please visit one of the geosciences booths today. I will be at the Geosciences Leadership Organization for Women, also known as GLO. My officers and I are looking forward to meeting you and answering your questions about geosciences and UT. Well, we're here and if there's any super quick questions for us before we have to move on to our next presenter, but I just wanna say again with Annabelle, Welcome and uh, come explore the planet with us. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Clark and Annabelle. We do have a couple of questions in the chat and I think we have a uh, few minutes to spare. So one of the questions was what exactly is petrified wood? Does it mean it's just scared? <laughs> that is a great one. So here's petrified wood. I don't know if you can see it very well, but what we have here is the original wood of the plant. All the little spaces between the cells in the original wood got filled typically with silica. Silica, you might know from, um, in how would you encounter different kinds of silica? Maybe Annabelle can help me out. Where do we encounter silica in our daily, daily life, Annabelle? Maybe on the beach, uh, silica? but anyway, so yeah. 
Yeah, definitely on the beach and some sands and rock formations. It's very present. Anyway, so the silica gets um, basically uh, incorporated into a liquid and it penetrates into the wood and it fills up all those little spaces and then uh, it gets uh, lithified. So these are things that happen, processes that happen deep underground well after the wood was on the surface. And you can get whole logs and trees that form in this way and enter the fossil record. So not scared wood, just remember that. Thanks for that clarification, Dr. Clark. I think we have time for one more question. Um, where do you know, like, how do you know where to go looking for these fossils? So all over the world, there's sort of generations of people just like you and your parents that have been looking at the ground and maybe they've noticed different unusual things. And that might be hundreds of years ago. And then scientists, maybe scientists that weren't interested in extinct life, maybe they went there and they talked to those people who lived in that place, who found those original bones. And what we do is we build a whole history of scientific storytellers that go way back deep in time. And we look at those observations and we say, hey, this looks like a dinosaur bone that was, was found in this place, I'd better go back there and see if there are more. This is a little tantalizing fragment. I want to know more. So we use things in the field like geologic maps, scientific papers. Those are all part of science stories that bridge us with scientists of the past and enable the science of the future. Hope that helps. Definitely. It's exciting to know that we could all be part of that uh, fossil history story. All right, well, thank you again, Dr. Clark and Annabelle from the uh, Jackson School of Geosciences. We're gonna welcome up the Cockrell School of Engineering with Dr. Christine Julian. All right, Dr. Christine Julian, would you like to join us? Hey, everybody, um, Christine Julian. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering here at UT Austin, and I'm also our Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Cockrell School of Engineering. I'm really excited to be able to welcome y'all to Girl Day 2022. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about the kind of stuff that I do because it's really exciting to me. Um, so I'm a software engineer. I work on building mobile applications, applications that people use every day. Um, so things that have kind of helped with the campus reopen after COVID or even just you know games to help kids learn to um, write their own computer programs. So that's the stuff I get to do every day as an engineer here at UT Austin. Um, you're gonna get to explore a whole bunch of other really cool engineering activities, whether they're related to programming and coding or related to other aspects of engineering, like building things or studying how water works or how chemicals work or how even biological systems work. So I really hope you guys uh, get to enjoy your whole day at Girl Day. Um, and we hope to see you in a few years here at UT. Um, so while wow, it seems like a lot of interesting stuff is going on in the Cockrell School of Engineering. Um, so I, I'm really thankful that they got to share some of that. Um, so next we're thinking about whether a concrete canoe can float. So we're gonna find this out from the video from the American Society of Civil Engineers here at UT Austin. Hey, what's up? My name is Antran. I'm a senior civil engineering student at UT Austin, and uh, I'm a concrete canoe captain, and this is... Yeah, I'm Boris Vilich. I'm also the other concrete canoe captain. I'm a civil engineering major, and I'm a senior. But Boris, what even is concrete canoe? That's a great question, On So, concrete canoe is a competition hosted by ASCE on a regional and national level. So a lot of schools will get together, make a concrete canoe themselves, a canoe made out of concrete, and then race them in some kind of body of water to see like who has the nicest canoe and who's able to like beat everyone else in the race. Mm -hmm. But does it float? It sure does. <laughs> How else would you compete? So on, how far along are we in the process? How built is our canoe? 
Our canoe is pretty built right now. We only have some, a few more finishing touches to do, but we're at an important stage in the process called curing. So a little fun fact, uh, once you make the concrete, after, after it's poured, you actually have to wait a day, and then you actually need to soak it in water. So concrete is actually very weak if you just let it dry, because water is needed for some chemical reactions to happen that will make, it'll just make the concrete stronger. And that's what you want, because if your concrete's weak, then it's going to break in the water and then all the other teams are going to be laughing at you. So what we did was we put uh, humidifiers underneath this plastic tarp, and that will just release constant moisture into the air. It gets trapped underneath the plastic, and that moisture that's trapped will make sure that the canoe is constantly moist and that the canoe's getting the water that it needs to become as strong as it possibly can be. So, when you want to design your canoe, you, know, you want to keep in mind what you want it to be good at. You want it to be fast, you want it to be good at turning. When you're in it, do you want it to rock a little bit or not rock at all? Like These are all important things to keep in mind when designing the canoe. So, you can make the shape boxy or curvy and that'll have an influence on like what it's good at. So once you decide what you want it to do, you start by designing the cross sections at certain lengths in the canoe. So you, once you've got those important cross sections taken care of, you can export it into some kind of 3D design software to see what it would look like as one cohesive piece. So you can kind of see here, like at each section, there's like some points that define that cross section, and then like it comes all together. Right now we're in the wet room, so basically imagine that this is what's happening inside of the tarp that was shown earlier. Uh, we would like to put the canoe in here, but obviously the canoe is like 19 feet long, so it's not going to fit inside this room. So we have to go with that setup. But ideally, whenever you test concrete, you put it into cylinders, cylinder shapes, and then you can break those cylinders later to find out how strong it is. So in order for cylinders to gain maximum strength, you put them into the curing room. Like so, that constant moisture is constantly dripping out. It'll always be humid in here, it'll always be moist. And then the water will seep into the concrete, you get used for chemical reactions, and you gain the maximum strength you can possibly get. A uh, little fun fact, at uh, seven days, you get about 65% of your max strength. And after 28 days of being inside this room, you'll be at about 99% of its maximum strength. So generally speaking, the only days that you want to test your concrete is at the seven day mark and at the 28 day mark. So whenever we make the concrete for the concrete canoe, we need to test some of its properties to make sure that it can actually, you know, be strong and flowable enough. So one of the tests is called the slump flow test. It's basically, imagine filling up a cone with concrete all the way up to the top, and then you just lift it up. And you're just trying to see how far that concrete spreads out. And that tells you about how flowable it is, which is actually pretty important because if you're placing concrete by hand, you don't want it to be flowable like at all. But if you're just pouring the concrete, then you want it to be extremely flowable. So knowing the difference between the two is really important whenever you need to make the canoe. Thank you so much for showing up for our presentation. We hope you enjoy learning about concrete canoe. And if you're interested in joining a concrete canoe team in the future, most universities have them. We encourage you to go give it a shot. It's really fun. You just gotta give it a chance. You gotta learn a lot and make new friends. All right, bye. Hey everyone, hello. Let's see, what kind of lessons do we have? I saw that one of the questions, um, which is actually a question I sort of had, is how is concrete not too dense to float? Well, uh, that depends on what you fill your concrete with. So we try to fill our concrete with a lot of lighter rocks. So uh, when they are placed in water, the water kind of moves to the side and helps push it up. And because those rocks that we put in the concrete aren't too heavy, the canoe can flow. Let's see. I see another question uh, that says, what happens when the concrete cracks? Well, that will depend on uh, how far in the process we are. Like early on, it's pretty easy to put some additional concrete on and cover it up. But closer to competitions, at that point, we would just have to cover it with duct tape. <laughs>
Yeah, that, that happens with a lot of teams. <laughs> uh, let's see, would a concrete canoe be any slower than a normal canoe? Um, well, the thing is, the concrete canoe is about anywhere from like 200 to 300 pounds. So yeah, just, just the fact that it's so much heavier, it would be slower. But on the other end, um, it would have a lot more momentum. So whenever you do start moving, it's harder for you to stop. Um, does, does the color of the concrete influence the way? Um, whenever you make the concrete, whenever you add color, it becomes more thick, it becomes more solid. So you have to keep that into account whenever you, um, whenever you start making a mix. Because if it's too solid, then you can't actually do anything. With it. Let's see how heavy is it? Um, we're aiming for our canoe to be about three hundred and forty pounds. So that should oh, be about how. Are y'all working on the canoe now? Yes, we are yeah. currently taking it apart. We're taking apart the uh, mold that we put it in. So once we remove it, you can see that concrete stick. Uh, how many people can it hold? It can hold up to four people. Comfortable. You could probably put five in there if you really wanted to. Um, did we make it? Yes, we made it from scratch. How will a concrete canoe not sink into the water? Uh, that's a secret. But if you wanted to, if you wanted to make it really, uh, oh, do you want to talk about it or should we tell them to join? Uh, well, I definitely recommend that you guys join any concrete new team that you guys could be a part of. If you're interested in civil engineering, it's a great experience to get some hands-on practice. Let's see. Oh, someone asked how, how big is it? Oh. It is 19 feet long. Yeah, 19 feet long. So it's like three adults long. Oh, when will it be ready? We're hoping it will be ready before for March 10th. It takes a while to build this thing and finish it. I see one how, how, how the water doesn't spill yeah. through the concrete. And that's because concrete, the holes between the molecules and the concrete are smaller than the hole of the or the size of the molecules of the water. Uh, oh. I see a question asking what color it will be. So, uh, well, I'm going to grab the uh, laptop for a second so you can look at the insides. So you can kind of see that there's a little bit of blue in there for like polka dots that are supposed to look like bubbles. But the concrete canoe itself is going to be like a darker gray color with blue on the inside and gold on the outside. How many times did it sink? Uh, preferably zero times. <laughs> we'll find out when we put it in the water for the first time. Let's see, is there any metal inside of it? That's a good question. There is no metal on the inside. Mm -hmm. Well, unless you count fly ash. But... Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, usually teams might put in, like, steel wires or something, but for us, we just put in, like, a, we just put in a mesh, yeah, a mesh inside of it. But that is, that is a good catch that needs to be reinforced. Uh, why would you make a canoe out of concrete? Just because you can? There isn't really much reason for that. Uh, let's see. You want to go down? Uh, let's let's see. see. That's a lot of questions. But thanks, everyone, for asking all of these. Like, we're more than happy to answer. Does it smell? Um, it, it does smell. <laughs> not bad. Not good. You know, it's just like a very earthy smell. Uh, does it work? We will find out uh after spring break <laughs> how fast is it depends how fast we're paddling yep uh, how long do you, does it do you, take to dry to dry it actually doesn't take that long the the concrete actually absorbs the water to use for um the chemical reactions so if anything it could be dry in like 12 hours and that's just if you leave it alone when you, you make, make a sample of concrete, why is it a cylinder well that's a great question um over time, there has been a standard uh, process developed for measuring the uh, strength and tensile strength of concrete. And so the cylinder is the shape that is the easiest to get that information from, which is why we use the cylinder. Mm -hmm. And someone asked, is the canoe eco-friendly? We actually use a lot of recycled materials to actually make the concrete. So a lot of this stuff is like stuff that people don't want to use when they make like iron or steel or anything. So we try to make it so friendly in the way that we use our materials. How many concrete canoes have y'all made? Um, throughout the 
since like what 1980s or something like wow. it's been a while like 30 plus canoes yeah <laughs> oh what's the difference between concrete and cement thanks so much for asking that that's a good question um uh, so cement is cement is the stuff that you use to make the concrete they're two different things so cement goes inside of concrete that's the big difference but what we can is add in other the canoe? things to the concrete so mm -hmm. You do, do you only do like one a year? Yeah, we only have enough time to do once a year. Let's see, if it dries too fast, will it crack? That is a really good question because uh, that is exactly what will happen. Well, uh, it, it, you will see it cracks on the outside, but it won't all the way through. But it's not nice to look at. Is there different kinds of materials? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into concrete. You can put like styrofoam balls in it if you really wanted to, and you can put like really teeny tiny spheres of glass in it if you really wanted to. There's so many different things you can put in it, but you gotta test it to make sure it works. Can you buy these online? Uh, I don't think not so. Anymore, no. <laughs> How heavy is this? Easy to transport? Like we said. 340 pounds and we're just gonna have to hope that a lot of us are big and strong enough to lift it <laughs> and move it around when we need to have you ever ridden in it we have ridden in past canoes so we're actually practicing to race um the canoe uh, in march so uh look forward to that is concrete like clay mm, it can be like a clay like consistency so like it feels like clay if you can get it thick enough but it's not actually clay itself I think someone asked how much did it cost to build. I think I've put it around like a thousand dollars in terms of like raw cost of materials. So about that much. Let's see, what's the capacity of this canoe? Well, it can hold up to four people in it, and it can support up to about uh, around two thousand pounds. Yeah, it's, it's really strong because it's made of concrete. Can we watch the race? I really wish y'all could. If you if you happen to be in Houston, then. Um, I mean, we'll definitely record it. <laughs> Let's see. Do you just make it or have you competed? Um, we competed two years ago yeah. before COVID happened. And no, we're making it again. And then we're going to compete again this year. Let's see, what temperature is better to float in? Okay. Um, water at about four degrees Celsius is the best temperature to float in. But that is not the best temperature to racing four degree temperature water will help uh, push the canoe up but it's very cold for paddlers let's see can we do something like this at home uh we would not recommend it <laughs> no uh, you would need a well ventilated area with a lot of space and hopefully a lot of people helping you because this is definitely not a one or two person job now we're lucky to have our team mm -hmm. and right. what body of water is in the race in it will be in a lake well, thank you so thank much, you, for your you all. Uh, this is awesome, awesome stuff. I didn't even know that concrete canoes even existed. So thank you for sharing um, all the tips on how to make a concrete canoe and what you all will be doing. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to see you all, um, the recording of you all actually racing. So we're going to turn from the water to the sky as we hear from the UT Austin's Association of Women in Astronomy research and education, otherwise known as AWARE. So we have a video for you and then some questions to answer live. Hello everyone. I'm so excited to be here today to be presenting to you for Girl Day. I'm here on behalf of AWARE on the Association of Women in Astronomy Research and Education. And today we have two big events planned for you. The first one is this, um, which is just going to be a short 10 minute planetarium show where I show you some of the really cool things that are in the night sky right now. In the afternoon though, um, it's really exciting because we're going to have it much more interactive. We're gonna have small groups where you can share your interests and you can go take a look at your favorite constellations and your favorite planets. You can talk about things like black holes and exoplanets and um, supernova explosions. And so um, we encourage you to come join us in the afternoon, especially if you have questions or wanna learn more about specific things in astronomy. Um, today, though, we're going, or this morning, we're going to go take a look at um, Stellarium, and so I'm going to pull that up. And um, this is what we're using for this virtual planetarium show. It's a 
free software. So if you're interested in having it on your own computer, you can just Google Stellarium and um, get it on your computer. But um, this is what the night sky or what the sky is looking like right now. Um, the sun is up, of course, but we're going to go ahead and fast forward to right after sunset. And um, just to orient ourselves, this is the view of the sky if you were just kind of like laying on your back in a meadow. And um, we're going to now take a look at what happens when we let the sun set. Okay, so now it's just after sunset and we can see that there's a lot of stars that are visible now. This is if you can get out to a pretty bright or a pretty dark sky. So you can see a lot of stars. Um, and one of the most famous constellations is up right after sunset. And so we're gonna start with that. Um, and some of you might already be able to find him, but we're gonna be looking for Orion the Hunter. And this constellation is easier um, to recognize than a lot of others. And so it's a good starting point. And then you can use it to find other nearby constellations using star hopping. And um, to find Orion, I always look for three stars that are very close together and form a straight line. And you can see them right here. That is the belt of Orion. And then there are going to be two stars up above it and two below it. And those are his shoulders and his ankles. And so this kind of forms a bow tie like shape, maybe a butterfly. Um, and that is Orion the hunter. And so we're going to take a closer look at Orion. This is what um, the constellation art looks like for him. You can see um, he's a man in the sky and he is a hunter. So he has this, this lion here and his, his club up, raised up in his arm. And um, he has a sword on his belt that extends down. And we're gonna take a closer look at some of the, the things in his sword in a minute. But to begin with, um, there's a really cool star in Orion, which is this one right here. It's actually his armpit. Um, but this star is called Betelgeuse and it is a red giant star. And so um, Betelgeuse got famous about a year ago um, because astronomers were thinking that it might explode any day now. Now we're thinking it might take a little longer, um, maybe another extra few million years, but um, it's this huge star that is close to the end of its life. And in astronomy terms, um, close to the end of its life doesn't mean too much. That could still be on the scales of millions of years. Um, but that's pretty short in terms of um, a lot of ages in astronomy at least. Well, um, Betelgeuse is this massive star that isn't too far away. And um, it's so big that if we were to replace the sun with the star Betelgeuse, um, it would actually extend out beyond Jupiter. And so it would completely envelop all of the inner planets um, within, within the star Betelgeuse. And so it's a huge star that um, is really cool and has, has gotten a lot of um, fame lately. And so if you, it's pretty nice to be able to find it in the night sky and point it out to, to your friends. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out in Orion is um, in his sword. And so I'm gonna remove the art and we're gonna go ahead and zoom in. Notice that there are these three points that form the end of Orion's sword. And the middle point is the one that I'm interested in here. So that one right there. And you can see this by eye, um, but it might look a little bit like a star and it's not actually a star. And so if you can get binoculars and take a look at it, you'll see that it's very fuzzy and it doesn't look like just a star, like a point on the sky. And that's because it's not a star, it's a nebula. And this is actually the Orion Nebula right here. And a nebula is just a region of space where there's a lot of gas and dust that is collapsing to form new stars all the time. And so you can see um, stars that are inside this nebula that were actually just recently formed um, and that are emitting a lot of light and making these, this gas and dust look really pretty um, with all of these colors. And um, we can show you so many more nebulae that are just beautiful. So you can join us in the afternoon to, if you're interested in that. Um, but for now, we're gonna keep on going. And um, one of, like I mentioned, one of my favorite things to do when I find one constellation is find out how to use it to find other constellations um, because it's a lot easier to, to um, navigate the sky if you, can, if you can use one constellation to find another. And so um, one of, the easier things to do here is take a look in front of Orion and see who Orion is fighting. And so 
um, you can look in front of the Orion constellation to find this V shape. And, and um, there's one bright star that is part of the V. And this is the star known as Aldebaran. And it is the eye of Taurus the bull. And the V forms Taurus's shape, his face. And um, notice that these two stars um, are Taurus's horns. They extend out from the V of his face. And we're gonna actually be looking out at his shoulder here. And so we're gonna zoom in over at his shoulder. And you might already notice something interesting there, which is that there are about seven stars that are all very close together in space in that little part of the sky. And you might know this um, as the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. And so this is a very famous little group of stars. Um, and you can see about seven of them with your just your eyes. Um, but if you look at it with binoculars, you can see about 50. And if you look at it through a telescope, um, like we're pretending to do now, you can see that there are actually hundreds of stars in that little part of the sky. And what's cool about this is that all of these stars were born together from the same cloud of gas, kind of like the Orion Nebula is just this cloud of gas that is forming these little new stars um, in it. And so this is kind of um, a similar case, except now most of the gas has been used up and has formed the stars. And so it's a, um, a little bit older than like the Orion Nebula, for example, and you have a lot more stars. And so this is called a star cluster. And right now, all of these stars are still kind of gravitationally bound to each other. They're held together. Um, and it is a really cool thing if you get a chance to look at it through binoculars, because you can see just so many stars in this little tiny part of the sky. All right, there's one more thing I want to show you before um, we wrap the, this up for the, for the morning. Um, and that comes out a little bit later at night. So we're going to have to fast forward a little bit. Um, before we do though, I'm just going to point out this little band of the light across the sky. Um, I don't know if all of you have gotten a chance to see this in the night sky before, but if you can get out to a pretty dark sky, um, you will be able to see it. And this is actually our Milky Way. And so um, we're in a galaxy called the Milky Way that looks like a little like pancake. It's like a disc um, that has a spiral in it. And we can talk more about this in the afternoon if you're interested. And um, from our position in this galaxy, um, we end up seeing it as a band of light across the sky. And so this is actually um, our own galaxy that we're seeing just as, as the stripe of light. And um, we can talk more about that later if you're interested. The thing that I want to show you though, just rose above the horizon. You can see it here, it's very bright. Um, this is our moon. And um, I don't know if all of you have gotten a chance to see it close up. So I wanted to make sure to, to show it off, but um, it's a lot of it is visible right now. Um, it's not a full moon, but we can see most of it. And um, we're gonna zoom in really far and get a good, view of it. So here's what our moon looks like up close. And you can see it's covered in craters. You can see areas where it's darker rock and lighter rock. Um, and we um, can, can explore this more later. And we can also take a look at some planets like this, where we zoom in and take a, a bigger look at it. So um, please join us in the afternoon if you're, if you're interested. But I'm going to have to sign off for now. Um, and if you have any questions, I think there will be a chance for that um, before we move on to the next presentation. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure to um, be here as part of Girl Day. And I hope to see you in the afternoon. Thanks. That was so interesting. Um, so thank you for that presentation. I'm definitely going to look into Solarium to help ID various stars in the night sky. Um, so it looks like we we do have someone here to answer some of these questions in the Q and A. Yeah, I so saw one of the questions is why do stars explode, and stars are a balance of gravity that's pulling everything towards the center and pressure, which is from the fuel being burned that is holding the star up. But eventually, when the star reaches the end of its life and it's done burning hydrogen and heavier elements, it will run out of fuel to keep holding itself up. 
and gravity will win and make the star completely collapse on itself, but then it will bounce back in a huge explosion, and this is a supernova. I also see some questions about the difference between astronomy and astrology. These are two different things. Astronomy is a science that um, tracks the celestial bodies in the sky. Astrology is a pseudoscience, and, but it is based on the zodiac, which are constellations in the sky. The zodiac are specifically the constellations that are along the line of the solar system. So our solar system is in a disk, and the path in the sky that all the planets that that we see the sun take through the sky is the, the constellations behind them are known as the zodiac constellations. And so um, the sun appears to be in those different constellations as we move in our orbit around the sun. And so that is why sometimes the sun appears to be in different constellations. It looks like we maybe have time for one more question if there was one you wanted to answer in the Q&A. I know there are some asking about the supernova, how it was formed, um, and then a little bit about Betelgeuse and whether it was a supernova. If you wanted to talk a little bit more about the supernovas. Um, so Betelgeuse um, we saw was fluctuating in brightness, which can be a sign that a star will soon go supernova. Um, but I think more recent studies have found that that might be related to dust. So between all the plant, the stars in the galaxy, there's other materials such as dust, and this can affect the, um, it can absorb light coming from stars and make them appear to be dimmer if it passes in front of them. So in this case, I think the fluctuations may have been due to dust. And while Betelgeuse will eventually go supernova, it's unlikely that it will happen in our lifetime is what we're thinking now. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering these questions. Um, and overall, I think looking at these stars and constellations was super interesting. Um, so thanks again for presenting on that. Thank you. All right, so we're going to pivot a little bit from the stars to looking at the sun. So we're going to explore energy with the UT Austin, Long, UT Austin Longhorn Energy Club. You've probably heard of solar panels, and maybe you've even seen them in real life. But have you ever wondered, how do solar panels actually work? How do these crazy inventions harness the power of the sun? Well, let's talk about the sun. You might not actually know it, but the sun powers more than just solar panels. It's actually the ultimate energy source for wind, water, and fossil fuels. How, you might ask? Well, the sun creates the wind, which we can use to power wind turbines, which produce energy. It also is the source for the water cycle, which powers our hydroelectric dams. The sun also causes plants to grow, which, after time, ultimately create fossil fuels. You might have talked about the sun before in science class, but let's talk a little bit more about it. The sun is really big. In fact, it's about 330,000 times larger than Earth. That's really big. The sun also gets really hot. It's 27 million degrees Fahrenheit which is about 60,000 times the temperature that your oven gets whenever you're making a pizza. How do we get solar panels to do the cool things that they do? Look at this frog, for example. Check out how the solar panel makes him hop around. Solar panels are made with special materials that absorb the sunlight and cause it to create electricity. Sometimes it's an element called silicon that make up PV cells. Basically what we're doing is harnessing concentrated solar power, the power of the sun. We can use it to power cars, like this toy right here, or even on a larger scale, we can power full-size cars, like our Longhorn Racing Team. In the future, we might even be able to drive cars like these all the time. Or check out how solar power can make music.
Right now we mostly use coal, oil, and natural gas. But these are non-renewable resources, which means eventually they're going to run out. In fact, if we keep using these non-renewable resources at the rate we do, we may run out of natural gas and oil in about 50 years. And we're expected to run out of coal in about 115 years. Not only are these resources non-renewable, and they're gonna run out, but they're also polluting our planet and contributing to climate change. That's not very good for our Earth. The sun, on the other hand, is a renewable resource. That means it's gonna last for the next five billion years, so we'll never run out of it. Other renewable resources like wind and water can also provide us with energy. But even with all the energy we can get from these two resources, it's still less than the 1% of the solar energy that reaches the Earth. It's clear that solar energy massively outshines its competitors. Solar energy is the best. And speaking of renewable resources, check out this wind turbine that's powered by a solar panel. The solar energy is causing it to spin. Notice how covering up the solar panel causes it to stop spinning. It might remind you of the wind turbines in Central and West Texas. Another renewable resource. Check out how solar energy makes this grasshopper spin around. Here at LEC, we love to have fun with energy. And we love to teach and talk with others about energy. We're always looking for fun ways to enjoy energy. So hopefully you learned something today about solar power, whether it be how it works or how it's changing the future as a, an incredibly powerful renewable resource. What cool things. I didn't realize there are so many things we could use solar power uh, panels for. So here we have Christian and Benjamin to answer some questions in the Q&A about solar energy. Hi, everyone. We're really excited to be here. Um, also, we had Carrie, but she wasn't able to be here today. But um, I'm going to go ahead and start out. I saw some really great questions in the chat. There's one that what happens when we run out of the materials to make solar panels? Um, that's actually a really good question. And to solve that problem, there's a lot of technologies today that are looking for different materials to make solar panels. That way, once the current materials we use run out, we'll have other options to keep harnessing the power of the sun. And also that kind of goes along with what are the problems with solar power? Right now, it's somewhat expensive to install solar panels. Um, but again, because of the same reasons, it's actually getting a lot cheaper to use solar panels. So this clean way of harnessing energy is accessible to a lot more people. I would also uh, like to add to that question real quick. And uh, hi, everybody. It's nice to see you all here. Um, but just to add to Christians, it's not um, just the solar panel materials that are causing some issues, but also um, storing the power we get from solar panels and uh, batteries and things like that can also use rare earth materials. Um, so it's kind of a constant challenge that uh, uh, we're still working on today. Kind of goes with another question I saw in the chat. Uh, someone asked, what happens if the sun goes off? Uh, that, you, that might also make you wonder, what happens at night when the sun's not out? Well, that's when we store the power from the solar energy and things like batteries. That way we can keep, keep our lights on at night or however long it's dark. Um, let's see. Solar panels can get damaged by things like hail, but we generally make them pretty durable so that no matter what weather conditions happen, um, they will keep working.
One of the questions was, can there be too much uh, solar power? Like, can solar panels have too much sun? That's a good question, Ben. Um, I think that depending, there is an optimal amount that you can have for certain things. If you do have too much, it can um, not be efficient. Uh, ben, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yes, uh, with solar panels, actually, we aren't. Um, the, the the main issue with them is uh, we we can't store their energy that well too much um, because they generate a lot of power during the day, um, and then during the night uh, they aren't generating any power, so we have to store that in batteries. Um, and so the current solution is just to have more solar panels, uh, which is not ideal, because. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of wasting a lot of power that's generated. Uh, the, the real solution we want to get toward is uh, better batteries and storage technologies. Um, so that is a good question. Can we have too many solar panels? Um, and we, we kind of do. Uh, I think Texas alone has enough solar panels uh, to power the United States. Um, we just can't store all that energy. Um, so I think the best solution would be better storage technologies. I also see some people asking about our current usage of non-renewable resources and um, when they're going to run out. If we do continue to use uh, coal, natural gas, and oil, which are our primary energy usages right now, those things will run out within the next uh, 50 and 115 years. And um, if we keep using them like we're currently using them. And because of that, uh, I see some people asking, when are we going to have all electric cars? Well, a lot of companies are promising to move to all electric within the next uh, 20 or so years, um, just because it'll help our planet more and make sure that we all can keep uh, living on this great earth. Awesome. Well, thank you, Benjamin and Christian, to help us answer some questions about our renewable energy source of uh, solar panels. We're now going to take it uh, over to um, learn about the Hyperloop with Texas Guadalupe. So I believe we have Yal and Trevor here to answer some questions about what is the Hyperloop. Hi everyone. Hi, my name is Yao Sin and I'm the head of business at Texas Guadalupe. And here I have Wen and Julie, um, if you want to introduce yourselves as well. Yeah, for sure. So my name is Wen and I am the uh, procurement lead at Texas Guadalupe. So my main task is to purchase the supplies that we need as well as keep in touch with the engineering students and to see what the progresses that they have made so far. Hi, I'm Julie. I'm the co-lead of the King team, and my main objectives are to safely accelerate the pod and work together with the other engineering subsystems. Awesome. Um, we're actually um, at one of our work days on Saturday, so this is a really good time for us to come together and discuss the progress we made during the week. Um, and we look forward to, you know, what we will do in, in the next week. So um, here we have a little video. Um, I will be sharing the screen so you guys can kind of get to know us a little bit more. So Hyperloop is originally Elon Musk's idea for a transit system. The original plan was to get you from one place to another as fast as possible, and as cheap as possible, and as environmentally safe as possible. Hyperloop tries to get you to move at hypersonic speeds in a controlled environment. The way you control that environment is creating a vacuum tube and putting a pod-like vehicle inside. And underneath that air pressure, you can reach hypersonic speeds much faster. You could travel somewhere that takes about four hours and cut it down to 15 minutes. Speeds in excess of 1,200 kilometers per hour are the ultimate Hyperloop goal. In August 2017, with 24 universities from around the world competing, the SpaceX test track saw one entry hit 324. Texas Guadalupe never got a chance to race their pod for glory, but they did still manage to turn plenty of heads. We won the Innovation Award for our levitation systems. 
Many teams have moved on to magnetic levitation. We were the only team there that had successfully built a completely air levitated pod that was able to flow frictionless in the controlled environment. As complex as this Hyperloop pod looks, the key difference that you should probably know is that this levitates on air bearings. And what's so neat about this disc, we've got four of these underneath the Hyperloop pod and they can lift 2,000 pounds each. And it functions actually a lot like an air hockey table. You put some air through these and it creates a thin layer that all of it rests on. They actually come from a warehouse applications, so moving around heavy weight, but a good amount of this Hyperloop pod from the pneumatics boards to these little hop tanks on the four corners, all of it is optimized to help these go at high speeds such as two, three, four hundred miles an hour. Somebody close these valves. Reaching high speed is the team's next big challenge. All right, all right, perfect. Today at their campus track, they're running a simple but important test. What we're looking at right here is our right height sensors, our laser optical sensors, and basically what we're testing is our right height as we're moving unloaded without any extra added weight. Uh, and then we're gonna do, run the test again and we're gonna have a couple of us stand on top of it, add a little bit of weight and loading to it, um, and see what the difference is. All right, guys, let's levitate. All righty. And go. For this year's competition, every team must design a propulsion system to push their pods through the vacuum tube. Texas Guadalupe's plan, build a small drive wheel that rides on top of the track's central I-beam. Load the pod. This test is step one in determining where to mount that drive wheel to the pod. Turn on levitation. And push. Let's go. It's extremely important because we want to make sure that we're not negating the effects that removing friction using air levitation is doing because that would be the entire reason to get us to that speed. As the pod moves, the laser sensors track the levitation or ride height at all four corners. Each corner should be roughly equal and remain stable for the full test run, no matter what external forces are applied. If our levitation system works perfectly, there should be no changes based on the uneven loads that we apply. The uneven loads kind of simulate the forces that are gonna be applied when we propel ourselves forward. We saw no changes, so test successful. <laughs> Okay, so everyone, um, now that you have a little bit more of an understanding of um, Hyperloop, um, now Wynn and Julie will each share their perspective of being on the business and engineering side of our teams and, you know, about their experiences. Yeah, for sure. So um, being on the business team, I have honestly learned a lot from the engineering and I like how integrated our organization is. And so our organization is divided by like, the business as well as the engineering team and being a part of the business team I get to see what the engineers do and also like go out of my comfort zone too because um there are like a lot of things that I have to learn from them and then we exchange of like really great ideas as well and so so far I have been loving my experience what you, Julie? Yeah, so for me on the engineering side, um, I love being in an environment where I get to create something new. Unlike cars that are like, we've been updating for a long time, we've, we're have we making something from the ground up. And on my side of the braking, we're, we're trying to go at at least 15,000 miles per hour. So we need, to, we, we need to find ways to safely decelerate this pod. So um, to answer Ava's question, if something goes wrong, so that's actually my side, I'm the braking engineer. And so we're planning on we're creating these new technologies that are using brake pads and these things called linear actuators. You don't have to worry about what that is. And we're just, um, so it just safely stops the pod by using kinetic energy to stop it. Um, someone said, um, but aren't magnets frictionless? Friction, frictionless, I mean. Um, so um, Julie, would you like to talk about the technology that we use? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, so for we're, we're actually using levitation right now, and basically it just uses two sets of magnets that are um, repelling each other. So basically, like the north and south poles are opposite each other, so it allows it to float up. So it technically would be frictionless when we're going across the our track. 
Um, how much does it cost to build a Hyperloop? Um, so it's a lot of money for sure um, to build our pods. So right now we're still in um, kind of a testing period. Mm -hmm. So um, the actual rails are, well, we go to competitions and that's what they would usually provide us. We have uh, one of the tracks ourselves as well. Um, it's a lot of money for sure. <laughs> Looks like we're almost out of time. Maybe we can do one more question. Um, someone asked, where would you go in a Hyperloop? Um, and some people said, can you go to space? <laughs> yeah, um, so at the moment right now, Hyperloop is used to go through like, different cities. Um, so like from, from Houston to Austin per se. So, and because the short amount of time that a Hyperloop can take, then that really increases the efficiency whenever you travel to let's like, say a, a really far away place and you don't have to live far away from say your future locations just in order to get there on time. Yeah, so although we can't go to space, we can totally go anywhere. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys so much. That will just be it for us. Um, it was great meeting all of you and seeing all the questions that you have. And yeah, it, we would love to connect with you guys further. Um, if you guys are more curious about what we do, please feel free to check out texasguadalupe.com. And yeah, I'll see you another time. All right. Thanks, guys. Ooh. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Texas Guadalupe. It was really interesting learning about this, um, this system and kind of the endless possibilities that go along with it. Um, so next, we're excited to welcome one of our Curl Day leaders, Abbott to join us for some virus hunting. Do we have Jessica, Lauren, Kevin, or Mike from Abbott who can um, pop up and talk to us about Abbott and virus hunting? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I believe we can. Awesome. My name is Lauren, and I'm a scientist at Abbott. Um, and I'm here with my team who's going to join in just a minute. Um, and do an experiment with you uh, at home to learn about virus hunting and all about viruses and germs. Because at Abbott, we have a lot of scientists and engineers that are doing everything they can to learn more about germs and, and viruses and how to keep us healthy. At Abbott, we make a lot of healthcare products that keep you healthy from when you're a tiny baby all the way up to when you're old, our grandparents and and grandma and grandparents. And so we need to be sure that we're doing everything we can to keep you healthy. And one of those things is learning about germs and making tests to, um, to keep you safe. So I'm gonna here with some special guests, um, some other scientists and engineers from Abbott, Jess and um, Kevin, and our very special guests, Noah and Allie, and they're gonna help us do an at-home experiment. We're just getting the video connected now. But if you like to do this experiment at home, it's very easy. You just need um, some tin foil, some sprinkles. Yeah. Some and I hear them now. Here they come. There they are. And they've got all of our, uh, as, as I was saying, you need sprinkles, tape, tin foil, soap, and water. So it's very easy. And what we're going to learn is how do germs react? when we mix them with soap and we wash our hands with soap and warm water. Here we go. We can't hear you. Yeah. Yep. Down. Okay, we're good. We're good. We're good. We can hear you guys. Hi. 
question. Okay. Hey, Ali Noah. Thanks for coming to help us today. Today we're going to do an experiment about germs, right? Yeah. Yeah. And are germs good or bad? Good. Bad. Yeah, bad. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and so today we're going to learn even learn a lot about well, about hand washing and why it's important, right? Well, scientists and engineers they help um, they help figure out why hand washing is so good, right? Like why using a soap is. So today we're going to build a model of a germ. Yeah. That's good. You're okay, making you make it smaller. Now what do we do? We're building the inside of a germ. Right? So you gotta push it real small. Now there's a little shell that goes around the germ, right? I did it just the perfect way. The perfect way. Okay, now next you need the shell that goes around the germ, right? So we take some oh, double sided goodness. tape and we're gonna wrap it around, right? I know. Yeah. And so what we know is that germs have this layer on the outside where these little sticky proteins that we're ah, using sprinkles for. Can I put yeah, so so they have little attachment proteins that help the sprinkles are germs. Right. And we don't eat any more germs. I don't want to eat germs. Yeah, we don't want to eat germs, right? So that's why we gotta wash our hands in warm soapy water after after we touch things, right? Okay, so you have your germ. Show everybody your germ. Hold it up. Okay, yeah, so those little germs, we want to get rid of those, right? So what are we going to do? Hot water, soap, then we mix it up, then the germs go off. Really? Okay, well, let's see yes. if that's true. Okay. Okay, so first, let's, do you want to put water in or soap first? Yes. Okay, yes. okay, no, okay. Okay. okay, so let's put it in the water. Okay, now can we add the soap? Yes, put a couple right. squirts of soap. Good job. It's about the Okay. When I mix it, it turns pink. All right. Oh, that's good. Okay, that's good. Okay, now stir it, right? So stirring Mom, it is kind of like when you go like this under water. It floats. It floats. Well, good. Now, what's happening to those little sprinkles? It goes. The germs go up. Oh, I love it. So that's why we wash our hands and we rub them together, right? It is. Okay, now let's see. Can you scoop up your germ? Looky there. Looky there. So now we have we've got almost all of the little attachment proteins or the parts that make you sick no, I'm just, gone away. I like the mix. Right? You did a great job. I like the mix. Yeah. I think I you... like your new soap. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we're really excited. We're gonna have some a breakout session this afternoon to talk well, I, about I get some more details so we can take, talk to you more about this experiment door. and um, different levels of it as well as um, what we do here at I see the so, Thanks, Trisha, for Mom, having me. I just see the jokes in the water. I know. I think I they are all gone. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> if it's there. That's okay. okay good it's, job. That's okay. It's still on here. What a fun experiment. And it's really great that we have the opportunity to, to do that at home as well. Um, is uh, Lauren still around to answer some questions? Hi everyone, yeah, I am here to answer some questions. All right, so in the Q&A, we had a few interesting questions. Um, yes. How are viruses and germs different? That's a great question. A germ, is another word for virus. When we say germ, we mean a lot of microorganisms that could make us sick. Um, viruses, bacteria, fungus, all of these types of, of microorganisms we can call germs. And how is it that germs get inside of our body and actually make us sick? That's a very good question. The sprinkles that you saw our assistants were putting on top of the ball of tinfoil, these represent proteins on a germ structure. And the proteins, when the germ gets into our mouth or in through our nose, they go into our own body cell and they act like their our body cell are the germ cell. And those sprinkles representing proteins is how they break open our cells and make us sick once we've gotten it into our, into our mouth um, or our nose um, or other ways. 
And how does Abbott study uh, these germs without getting sick themselves? <laughs> Great question. We use a lot of protective equipment like gloves, um, goggles, uh, lab coats to protect ourselves from getting sick when we're learning about germs and when we are looking at them under a microscope and trying to understand how they're made and what happens when we mix germs with things like soap um, or other ways to, to identify and test them. All right, some of the other questions we're asking, how do germs change, sort of like the COVID virus changing? That's another great question. Um, our scientists are studying that every day because they're changing sometimes faster than we can keep up with learning about them. But the way that they change is through the, the outer proteins on the edge and how those are, are remember we mimic those with sprinkles, how those are structured and formed could take different shapes and sizes. And so if we make a vaccine or a test to um, test for a certain size and shape, and then the virus changes, we also need to learn how to do that so we can change our tests and treatments. Very cool. Now, are all germs bad? Most germs are bad. That's, that's a great question. We always want to keep ourselves very healthy by washing our hands. Different germs can, can cause different types of diseases. So some of them cause COVID, as you guys have, have heard about. Some of them just cause a, cause a cold. Um, and we have different ways to treat them depending on if the germ is very, very bad or if it's like a common cold that might make you sneeze. But are there any sort of bacteria or fungus um, that is good for us to have, both either outside or inside our body? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it's good to have certain types of germs inside of our body that um, help us to break down uh, the things that we eat or to fight off other germs when they come into uh, our system. Awesome. What is the difference between viruses and bacteria? <laughs> Yeah, I think we have to get that's a, that's a great question. And to be honest, I, I would have to consult our, our um, scientists at Abbott who are studying these viruses and bacteria every day. All right, we have time for, I guess, one more question. Looking at this soap experiment, how exactly is it that soap helps get these germs off of us? That is an excellent question. And, and the germs, as you saw our assistants making, have um, a tape layer on top of the tinfoil. Um, and this tape layer could be different forms, um, but what it causes, we used sticky tape because the tape sticks to the sprinkles, which represent these proteins. When the soap interacts with this tape, it makes it, um, it breaks apart the, the casing or the protective covering on top of of the germ. And so the soap breaking apart that tape and making it unsticky, then had all of our proteins or sprinkles fall off. So what soap does is it breaks apart the structure of the germs or the viruses such that they can't get inside of our cells. Awesome, it's so great to know what's actually happening when we wash our hands. And what a great reminder to keep washing your hands uh, That's during right. this COVID time. We'd like well, to invite everybody to come to our booth later this afternoon on Gatherly, and we'll do the experiment in a few different types of ways with water, without water, and we can learn a lot more. So come and join us. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, and all of you at Abbott for giving us such a fun demonstration. We are gonna switch over to the UT Austin Women in Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering um, to look at another demonstration on how to create a water flood. I am an officer for WPGE here at the University of Texas Austin. Today we'll be doing a demonstration showing how water and oil separate. Yes, so first, your first step is to put oil in the bottle. Today we're using gummy bears instead of rocks, but you can use rocks at home. So you're just going to put a whole bunch of oil in there. And this is similar to how in underground reservoirs, um, oil is saturated in between the rocks. You want to have a whole lot of oil in it? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, okay. And we're going to swish it a little bit. Oops. I got it. We're going to swish
between the oil and the water phase. And so this is similar to like in a reservoir because um, in reservoirs you have oil, right? And we inject water into it because the oil and water don't mix. So it allows us to extract oil from the reservoir. Mm -hmm. And so that is the idea of a water flow. This is another video so you can see the separation between the oil and the water. Thank you. That was a really interesting demonstration. Um, and I think we have a few folks here, um, Brooke and Penelope, if you want to talk a little bit more or answer some questions from the, the Q&A. Yeah. Hi, guys. My name is Brooke. I'm a president of the Mature Engineering. And so I know the video was a little difficult to hear. Apologize for that. Um, we were in a classroom setting, so it was really fun to do. Um, but basically what we were trying to show you guys is that there are reservoirs everywhere. Um, on earth. And so as petroleum engineers, what we do, we're trying to extract the oil from those reservoirs um, so that we can power our cars, power our homes. Um, and sometimes we also extract gas from those reservoirs as well. Um, and that's how, you know, we get electricity and we heat our homes, especially in these cold months. <laughs> and so um, basically what you do, you're injecting water because water and oil don't mix. And so as you can see on the video, there's a separation between oil and water. And so we use that to our advantage. And once we inject the water, the oil automatically is pushed to the top and it comes out um, for extraction. And then so we can um, you know, use it and package it. And like I said before, power all the stuff that we use today. So um, me and Penelope are here to answer any other questions that you guys have. So just fire away. Um, I see, how do you know where the oil is? Okay, so that's a really good question. So um, as petroleum engineers, there are a couple like sub-disciplines or um, categories of petroleum engineers. And so reservoir engineers, which are a different or our type of petroleum engineers, um, they go through like geological data. So that means that they're going on to these plots of land where they think that there's oil. And then they take a whole bunch of measurements, um, they do a whole bunch of tests, and then they determine um, based on the data that they collect whether or not there might be oil present. And so once they figure out if there's oil present, then they get more geologists and more scientists to figure out how we can get the oil out of that area. So hopefully that answers your question. And then I see another one. Okay, so how does the oil separate from the water? Like why? <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> so that's based on chemistry. Um, and so oil and water have different densities. So for example, water has a density, I think it's I think it's one gram per centimeters cubed or something like that, but it's not important. Units are important. But basically what that means is that oil is um, has a lighter density than water. So what that means is like when you put water and oil in like a cup, the water stinks to the bottom because its density is um, higher, right? And so the oil is able to go to the top because it has a lower density. So it's, it's lighter than the water, so it can sit on top of it. So that's why um, they separate, um, this, the phases separate. Uh, let's see. Mm. How long does this take? I think that's a good question. Um, so this take, this, this, it can vary. Right. So typically when petroleum engineers are um, looking at drilling a well or reservoir engineers are like, OK, there's oil here. How are we going to extract it? Um, they get a whole team together and they try and figure out how long it's 
going to take. So it depends on the equipment that you're using. It depends on um, like where you are. Um, so for example, some places that we drill in the Permian Basin um, are way different geologically than, for example, um, an offshore rig in the Gulf of Mexico. So it just depends on your location, depends on your equipment, it depends on what company is doing it. Um, sometimes companies have different timelines on extracting oil. So that's how that works. And then I saw a question, how does fracking work? So hydraulic fracturing um, is probably a very common term that you've heard. Um, and hydraulic fracturing actually works a little bit differently than um, traditional drilling a well and extracting oil. So hydraulic fracturing is done horizontally. So that means that um, as petroleum engineers, we put a type of pad and it almost looks like a vertical well, um, but below the surface, there's a uh, horizontal pad that goes into um, different types of rocks like shales. Shales are the main rocks that we do hydraulic fracturing on. And so the horizontal pad goes through the shales and it travels laterally and then um, it breaks the shell shales. And so that breaking is what we call fracturing. And so um, by breaking the shale, we are extracting or giving the oil that's within the shale an opportunity to flow out of it. Um, and so that's what fracking is in, in a nutshell. Uh, let's see, I'll take one more. Do all types of oil separate from water or just certain types? That's a really good question. Um, there actually is different types, there are different types of oils. So the ones that I showed you in the demonstration, which is baby oil, right? And so baby oil is pretty light. Um, so you can see the separation pretty well. But as petroleum engineers, you do have to um, estimate, right? Like whether or not one oil will separate or from another because some oils are really heavy. So some oils, like they're called crude oils, they have a lot of stuff in them. So they're not as like light and clear as the baby oil. And so sometimes um, they don't really separate from water that well. So you have to apply like different chemicals or different equipment to make sure that you get a separation so you can extract both. Um, and sometimes there are issues where um, the oil doesn't separate fully from the water. So you get a lot of reduced water that you don't really want, it's very icky. Um, and sometimes you, you get a nice clean separation in like in the baby oil and water flood experiment. Okay. All right. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, <laughs> no <cool>. problem. <laughs> um, thank you guys. Yeah, so that was, yeah, super interesting. Thank you for the demonstration and answering all of our questions. It looks like a cool demonstration that you could maybe even try at home. Yes, definitely try it at home and come see us later this afternoon at our booth for any more questions. Great, thank you again. So now we're gonna think about how you can create a cloud in a jar. So we're gonna experiment this with Texas State University Society of Women Engineers. Have you ever looked up in the sky and wondered how clouds are made? Well, you're in luck, because today we're making clouds. All you need are these very simple supplies, so let's see the supplies listed. In this cup is the warm water, a metal tray with ice, a glass cup suitable for heat. For matches, any brand will do. With all our ingredients here, you want to start by getting your warm water, and you want to make sure it's not too lukewarm, but a little bit on the hot side. Go ahead and pour it up to your desired amount depending on the size of your cup so I'm going to do it about halfway then make sure you have your parent for the next step so for the parents you want to get your little matches and go ahead and strike the box make sure it's away from you as you do this go ahead and blow it out and as it soaks drop it in the jar Quickly get your ice tray and cover the jar. So slowly but surely, you're gonna see some clouds form. So let's wait just a couple minutes. Finally, the clouds are made. This process is called evaporation, where we have the warm water vapor rising to the top and hitting the ice tray to create the clouds. Hello. I hope y'all enjoyed that video. 
So could anyone tell me what exactly happened? I did say it in the last part of the video, but there is one thing that I did not mention. Can anyone tell me what that is? Yes, it did evaporate, but what else did it do? Yes, it is part of the water cycle. Yes, it is condensation. Yes, because of the heat of the warm water and the match. Yes, evaporation and condensation, it's good. <laughs> yes, if you open the jar, the, the vapor will come out from the top. So it looks like there are a few questions in the Q&A. Um, what mm -hmm. does it mean, um, or how is it that the water is always warm and the sky is always cold? I know here in Austin, sometimes you jump into the water and the water's kind of cold. I think that would be because of the hemisphere we're in. How long would the clouds last? It depends on how warm the water that you put inside the jar and how cold, how much ice you have on the tray. There was another question on why do some clouds look different? Hmm. I wish I could answer that. Brianna, can you tell us a little bit about your what you're studying in school and maybe tell us what is the Society of Women Engineers? Yes, so I am a digital media innovation major, and that is one of the majors under tech for Texas State. And for Society of Women Engineers, I'm the outreach coordinator, and we focus a lot of building the careers of our women in STEM. We do a lot of resume building, networking, and provide a social place for our girls to really bond together. And we also have mentoring programs so that we can really rely on each other and build a community. And that's our main focus. Oh, great. So um, could you tell us a little more about this cloud experiment? If students wanted to do this at home, um, is there different clouds you can form with, with this experiment in terms of um, using cold water and a warm tray? Mm, That's a good question. I didn't try the reverse, but I think it's just depends on the temperature of the water. Because I did try um, boiling hot water and lukewarm water. And the boiling hot water did um, form faster, like the clouds did form faster. And I exactly didn't need the match for that, but it just probably the temperature. Awesome. Just trying to look over a few more of the questions. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you got involved in engineering? Yes, so originally my freshman year, I studied pre-dental and um, I had spent the summer with my uncle and he had taught me how to work on the lights for the house. So I was working directly with like wires and circuits and such. So I studied electrical engineering for my first semester. Then I was introduced, I had a minor in computer science. So I was introduced to CS more and I got more intrigued. Then I switched to digital innovation. It was more hands-on with technology versus coding. So I found love more of that. 
And now I work like directly with 3D scanners and Raspberry Pis and it's just so fun. I actually have my 3D printed head right here. That is so cool. I don't know if you can see, but um, yes, this is a pretty new major and it's under STEM, so I'm having a lot of fun. And could you tell us a little more about how we can see engineering and maybe our day-to-day -day lives, like not necessarily experiments at home, but what kind of things can we see, say, on a walk or in the city? So in the city, you can definitely see through infrastructure, you have construction engineering, and this sidewalk that when you walk on, you know, engineering, the technology they have to make it, you have the cars, you have the disc inside it and the chips, like everything around you is made because it's engineered and tailored for your use. So, yeah. Very cool. I guess we have time for one more question. Um, so when, um, sorry, I like blanked for a second, my apologies. Um, so when you are choosing engineering, how do you know what kind of questions um, to go for? What kind of things that, you know, need more engineering, I guess? That's a good question. When I was choosing my major, because I was pretty school at that time, switching around, I did a lot of research on YouTube and the fact that I did get to be hands-on with circuits and that was like an introduction and I also did take um, physics and other math classes in high school. I think the best thing to ask is, what do you see yourself doing day to day, day to day? Like, would you rather work with electricity or would you like be a petroleum engineer and be on the field and such? So I think the main focus is just to see what you really wanna do in a day-to-day -day life and get the hands-on experience as much as you can. It doesn't have to be super wild, but just little experiments here and there, even by yourself. Yeah, definitely being curious and exploring and finding yeah. out what really is your passion. Well, thank you so much, Brianna. And uh, thanks to everyone at the Texas State Society of Women Engineers. Um, very cool cloud experiment for everyone to try. Speaking of really cool experiments, we're going to look at the cooling effect of liquid nitrogen on hot dogs, bananas, and roses. Later on, we'll hear um, from a meteorologist about the TV station and weather, again, especially in Austin, this cooling effect. Hi everyone, my name is Marissa and I'm a computer engineer at AMD. My job is to work on the chips that go into laptops. If you've ever used a laptop for an extended period of time, you'll notice that it gets really warm. If you've tried to play video games on a laptop, the bottom gets really hot. This is a natural process. All the energy is used to power the computer. At AMD, we intentionally push our computers to do as many things as possible. But if we let our computer get too hot, it can damage the insides. So to take computing to the absolute extreme, we can use a chemical called liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is an extremely cold liquid. In fact, it's less than negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. By pouring this liquid on top of our computers, we can remove any excess heat extremely effectively. Because we now no longer have that heat to worry about, we can use much more power than before. But how cold is it really? Today, with the help of a friend in the AMD lab, we'll find out by freezing some common objects using liquid nitrogen. Have you ever put a banana in the freezer? Have you ever noticed how long it takes for that to freeze? Well, if you consider that a freezer is around zero degrees Fahrenheit, it should freeze much faster in liquid nitrogen. But how fast? Let's ask Landon in AMD's Device Analysis Laboratory to show us. Hey everyone, my name's Landon and I work in the Device Analysis Lab at AMD. And today we'll be freezing some stuff starting off with this banana first. I have a vat of liquid nitrogen set up here on the floor. And what we're going to do is going to take this banana and you can see it's a fresh banana. And we're just going to stick it right in. 
Now the freezing process for this took about five minutes, so I will speed up the film here in a minute, but you'll notice how frozen it actually looks whenever I pull it out. Whoa, that was really fast. But how can we be really sure it's frozen if we're not there? To see what freezing a banana this fast can do, I'll remove the liquid nitrogen off of our cardboard plate and I will place the banana on here and strike it with a hammer. And you can see, it just falls right apart and straight into two pieces, kind of like it was made of porcelain. Whoa! That was pretty cool! Wait, is that a hot dog? Yep. This is a hot dog, and we're gonna freeze it. We'll just dip it right in with some tongs. And now we'll pull it back out with those tongs. And you can see when we pull it out, there are actually cracks in the meat that have formed because it froze so quickly. And just like our banana, this one makes a nice little hard tapping sound. And we can also break this one straight into two pieces. So here I have a regular glow stick, you can see once I snap it and shake it, it gets pretty bright pretty fast. I want you to think about what's going to happen if I stick this in liquid nitrogen. Is it going to get brighter? Is it going to get dimmer? Let's find out. On the left side I have a tank that just doesn't have anything in it at all. We'll put a normal glow stick in there to see what happens when it's just air around it. And then on the right side it's a tank of liquid nitrogen. And now when we drop it in, you can see the glow stick gets brighter at first, but watch closely. Have you noticed it yet? The light's getting dimmer inside the tank. The nitrogen is slowing down the reaction by freezing the chemicals inside. And right about now, it's basically completely dark inside of that tank. So I'm going to fish them out with these tongs, and I'll leave the frozen one on the right side, and I'll leave the regular one, unfrozen, on the left side. And we can watch what happens as the stick begins to thaw out. So about five minutes after I left them out, you can start to see the one that was in the nitrogen is starting to get its glow back. It's starting to thaw out a little bit. And then about five more minutes later, we get almost the entire glow back from the frozen stick. Extreme cold can cause materials that are normally flexible and bendy to stiffen, and in some cases become very brittle. Let's have Landon show us this with a rubber ball. Now, normally rubber balls are quite squishy and bouncy. Let's have Landon try to dunk the ball and see what happens. So up next is indeed a rubber racket ball, and because this ball won't fit into the opening of my tank, we are just going to have to pour liquid nitrogen straight on top of it. And to make sure it gets really frozen, I'll be holding it down with some metal tongs. As this is freezing, try to think about what you think is going to happen. Obviously you can expect that this ball will be frozen solid, but how will that affect the bouncing properties? Well, once I get the ball out and move all this equipment out of the way, we can test that out. Because the ball is essentially solid and frozen solid, it kind of bounces like a marble at first. But as it thaws out, 
it becomes a little bit more elastic and actually just absorbs the energy when it hits the floor, thus causing it not to bounce at all. Once it thaws out completely though, it'll be back to being bouncy. But what if the object is already brittle, like a flower? What happens in that case? Yes, so next up is indeed a flower, and this is a rose. It smells pretty good and looks pretty nice. I say we should freeze it. As you can see, this is a fresh flower. It's very delicate, but also very soft. It doesn't fall apart when I touch it. So we're going to stick it in the cup, and just like the rubber ball, we're going to pour liquid nitrogen right over the top of it. And now, while I'm doing this, start thinking in your head of what's going to happen to the flower once I pull it out and start handling it. Chicago Windler, the chief meteorologist at CBS Austin News. I thought the best way for you to see what my job as the chief meteorologist is, is to look at a day in my life, or should I say a night in my life. So let's head inside. We have a mask policy, so I'm going to put my mask on and then take you inside the studio. So we are inside the newsroom right now, and this is where our reporters and photographers and editors and producers and our assignment desks, they all sit on a weekend, which is when I'm taping this. It's a very bare bones staff, so that's why everything's so empty. But we also have a lot of people who are working from home. But this is where a lot of that happens. Now I'm gonna take you into the Weather Center. So let me show you a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff that you don't see when you're watching on TV. This is my microphone, which I have strapped around my leg right here. I also have another box that I wear around my leg that is where my earpiece plugs into so that I can hear the control room whenever they're telling me how much time I have. This is the weather computer and I'm actually able to remote in so I can do weather from anywhere. In fact, during the, much of the pandemic, I spent a good part of the uh, about 18 months, in fact, working from home where I would log in on my computer and I can actually just use my mouse and zoom around and go through the weather graphics like this. And I put them all together, just like you would put together a PowerPoint. I'll look at computer models and maybe look at different types of precipitation and track when we could see rain or storms or this kind of thing. Once I get all that put into place, then I go on the air and do my broadcast. You can vote at any location in the county where you are registered. The primary runoff is scheduled Stand by. for May 24th, 2022. 2022, the general election coming up November 8th. Now, your Storm Tracker weather. What began as a crazy weather weekend turned into an absolutely spectacular Sunday. 48 degrees right now are high, though. 67, pretty nice given where we started. 30 degrees at Camp Mabry and a record of 23 this morning at the airport. Big difference now is 20 degrees warmer than that. There are a few locations that under clear skies and light winds have dropped down into the 30s, but by and large, 
everyone is at least four degrees as much as fifteen degrees warmer right now than this time yesterday. so what's the difference? we have a bit of a southwesterly breeze and that will continue to keep the mild air in place. also some cloud cover down in deep south texas may try to nudge into our southernmost communities but the rest of us stay clear. what's next our next weather maker. it's still way out in the pacific. however when it gets here wednesday night and into thursday it could bring in a possibility of some storms. you can track those on our cbs austin weather app and i'll track them for you coming up in your full forecast. but for now not as many locations freezing but if you're in the hill country it will still be possible. Fun. I got a degree in meteorology as well as a degree in broadcast journalism and I've been very fortunate to be able to do something I love and it's never the same thing twice. I always have different weather setups, different challenges, whether it be snow and ice or thunderstorms or drought or hurricanes. There's always something exciting and something different about my job. So I absolutely love it. I would encourage any of you who are interested in science and math and think you might be interested in weather to do more research on it. There are so many online resources that you can use and that you can find in order to learn. And if you decide that you want to pursue it in college and maybe pursue it as a career, it's not just on air for television. You can work for the National Weather Service. There are lots of other applications for meteorology as well. So Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was interesting and informative. And if you do have any questions after the fact, feel free to drop me an email right here. Great, so those are some really interesting presentations, both on liquid nitrogen and on meteorology. So we're gonna wrap up this morning with an exciting finale. So we're going to welcome science cheerleaders. And if you want to raise your hand and actually participate on screen with us, go ahead. This is a great way to get all of us interacting with each other in this finale. Hi, everyone. So Jeannie and myself that you'll see here, we are part of the Science Cheerleaders. And for those of you who have not heard of us, we are a group of cheerleaders. So we are all former and current professional cheerleaders, usually for the NFL or NBA, but we also have careers in STEM. So my name is Samantha and I studied industrial engineering and now I am a project manager for an IT company and I was a cheerleader for the Arizona Cardinals. Jeannie, are you able to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Jeannie. I cheered for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Orlando Predators. I was a construction mechanic in the Navy, and now I am an emergency and trauma nurse. Thanks, Jeannie. So before we start our whole event today, we wanted to do a cheer that anybody can do. So if you've never cheered before, that's okay. We will walk you through it. And then later today, I hope you guys visit us. Um, we will be doing a binary activity with you guys and also some more Q&A. So before I teach the cheer i'm going to share with you guys the words and then i'll take it away and then i'll share it again after but i want to make sure you guys know it um so first i think okay maybe i won't share it yet okay so i will go ahead and just teach it nice and slow so the first part is, and you can do this in your chair or you can stand up with us, either way will work. The first part, just adjust, is everybody do the science rumble. And it's really easy, just put your hands on your hips and then clap. Everybody do the science rumble. So again, that's Everybody do the science rumble. And the next line goes, everybody. And then I want you to stomp your feet really loud. Rumble. 
And then we do it again. Everybody do the science rumble. Everybody rumble. You guys got that? You want to do it again? Yeah, let's do it again. Yeah. Do it again? Yeah. All right. Again. Yeah. Do it again. Everybody, yeah. use your science. Rumble. Everybody, rumble. Everybody, do science. Rumble. Everybody, rumble. All right. Are you guys ready for the last part? Yeah. So, yeah. We rumble. It goes. Girls can do anything. Science. Science. And oh, cheerlead. Yeah, so again we go. Girls can do anything. Science. And cheerlead. And cheerlead. And after we do it again, but we go. Girls can do anything. Engineer and cheerlead. Yeah. So let's do it all the way from the beginning, and then we'll do the last part after. Okay, they're gonna do the whole thing now. Everybody do science rumble. Everybody. Everybody. Rumble. Everybody do the science rumble. Everybody, Everybody. rumble. Girls can do anything. Science and cheerlead. Girls can do anything. Science engineer. Cheerlead. And at the end, to finish it off, I need a big go science cheer from everybody. We'll go, go science! Go! Go! All right, let's put it all together from the top. Ready? Five, six, seven, eight. Engine, everybody do the science rumble. Everybody rumble. Everybody do the science rumble. Everybody rumble. Girls can do anything. Science. And cheerleading. can do anything. Engineer. And cheerleading. Uh, uh, science. Science. Oh, guys. You guys want to do it one more time? Yeah. 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 All right. Five, six, seven, eight. Everybody, everybody rumble. Everybody, everybody rumble. rumble. Everybody do the science rumble. Everybody, everybody rumble. rumble. Girls can't do anything. Science, science. and cheerlead. Girls. Can do anything. Engineer. And she Go. Go. Good job, everybody. We hope we'll see you guys later today and we can do more activities together. Yay. Good job, guys. Everything was frozen. Awesome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to our fabulous science cheerleaders. Thank you, Samantha and Jeannie. We hope that lots of you participants go out there and explore Gatherly this afternoon and connected with our science cheerleaders to learn more about what they do as scientists and engineers, and also to maybe do some more cheers and some experiments and all of those fun things. So thank you again, Samantha and Jeannie, that was awesome. 
So just a few things to note. Um, first off, thank you, thank you, Allison and Emily, our amazing MCs for the day. They did a fantastic job. One of the things that we know that all scientists and engineers and mathematicians and technologists have to do is be able to communicate and to answer questions and to talk to people. And so Emily and Allison were definitely demonstrating that today as they walked us through all of the fantastic activities. So thank you, thank you, Allison and Emily. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great to be a part of today. Yay. So what's up next? Um, first off, thank you uh, to our fabulous presenting partners, BASF and Halliburton. You heard from them early on in the recording a long time ago. And so thank you to them for supporting Girl Day and all of our participating organizations and partners. We're gonna have a little bit of bonus coverage here in just a moment. We are going to check back in with the UT Austin Glass Shop. If you remember, they have been working already and they're going to continue working this afternoon on bringing some inventions to reality. We had four amazing finalists of our competition to come up with a, a product, a solution to some world challenge with four amazing designs and our glass shop could not decide which to pick from between our finalists. And so they're gonna be working on all of those um, designs for our, our four finalists. We're gonna bring in one of our, our finalists to share her design a little bit, but again, we're gonna bring in the glass shop in just a moment to uh, share some bonus coverage of where they are in this design process. I also wanna remind you that the material list for this afternoon's activities can be found on the Girl Day website. And maybe one of my fabulous volunteers can throw that into the chat. Um, we also are going to be in Gatherly this afternoon. So check your email, check your spam, just in case you registered and can't find that, or click on the link on our Girl Day homepage to register to get that link to join in to Gatherly, the platform we're using this afternoon. One pro tip for Gatherly, you'll see a little map in the top right side of your screen when you log into Gatherly. You actually click on people's avatars. You click on their little box to be able to connect in with them in a video chat to join in the hands-on activities and experiments. Or you click on a, a circle that has a number in the middle that shows you that a group is being formed and that number indicates how many people are in that group. So you click on the circle or you click on the little square to join in with our volunteers to do the hands-on activities and the demonstrations in small groups with them this afternoon. So round up some materials. You can use kind of anything that you find around your house to make things work. And if you don't have the exact materials that are listed, that's okay. You can probably find some other things or our volunteers will help you figure out some alternatives to use. So with that, I see our glass shop folks are back. So I am gonna bring Adam back onto the screen here and let him fill us in on where are we with this turning glass uh, ideas into reality. Song for a moment. I see things working. Is that glass? That's Adam back there working on things. What do y'all have going on there that you want to tell us about? Anything? What is glass spinning? Do we have, oh, we do. We have our, we have our, one of our finalists that's back to tell us a little bit about her design. I think we can bring, bring our finalist back onto the screen as well. Isabel. Trisha, I think we have Van on. Yes, with Isabel. With Isabel, you wanna talk about your design? Oh, I see you, hi. Hi, Isabel, tell us what you came up with. I made a machine that takes up trash 
and it has a compost recycling in a trash bin. And it has this special sprayer that sprays into the air to help um, uncontaminate some of the air. And oh my goodness. I think we need that. That does all kinds of things. That is awesome. Well, do you see them working on some of the glass in that one picture? That is glass in the middle that is spinning and making a bulb. Wow. Yeah, and it looks, yeah. So your invention is going to come into reality. And I think in our one screen, y'all are gonna to have to take the blur off of Zoom so that we can see what you're putting out there. Yeah. Ah, they're share, showing us some of their creations here. Ooh, they look cool. Yes. So congratulations on being one of our finalists. Be sure to check in with the glass shop this afternoon in Gatherly. Look, here they're creating things. Do y'all want to, and if y'all want to come off mute and tell us what you've created there, what you're showing us, that would be awesome. Wow. All right. This is our trash bot. Let me see who was the inventor behind this one. This is Isabel's. This is Isabel's. Isabel, this is yours. Oh no, is this Isabel's is the air, the one that cleans the air, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just about to start that one. <gasps> so you gotta check back in a little bit. Yeah, so I'll be actually, that's the thing spinning now. So I'm about mm -hmm. to start that. We just had a plumbing emergency and one of our sinks won't stop. <laughs> So uh, we're, we're just keep trying to, you know, keep it as interesting as possible. But yeah, this one. Look rolls. at that. This, I believe, yeah, the specifications where it picks up trash. It's a robot. We decided to make it solar powered. Um, and yeah, this picks up trash and then we'll eventually be able to take them to our trash composting air purifier. So that's next up. Yay. So I'll get to that because that's that'll be much more interesting to see fire. Uh, and we'll keep this right here. Look at that. Awesome. Well, thank you, Isabel, for creating something super cool that our world needs. And thank you to the glass shop for turning these ideas into reality. Oh, look, there's one of our other finalists. So we are going to have the glass shop on Gatherly all afternoon. They're going to be showcasing all of these designs. Was this your design? It was not. It was not. Okay, so yours is the one that um, was the automated trash pickup robot. This is the one that um, is world hungry. Ends World Hunger. All right. Well, they're working on that one next, I guarantee. So make sure that you all join in Gatherly this afternoon to see your fabulous creations coming to life. Cool stuff, y'all. Thank you to the Glass Shop. Thank you to our fabulous students, our Girl Day Girls, for submitting your, your awesome inventions. I can't wait to see them coming to life. And with that, we're going to close out our Girl Day Zoom webinar. Thank you again for joining in today. Thank you again to Emily and Allison for emceeing all day. We will see you on Gatherly. Check the Girl Day website. The links are in the chat to get connected in this afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Bye.